Well, we are continuing Jesus returning or the return of the king, and we are in week four, technically week five, but week four in the message series, and we are looking at a timeline of the tribulation, and we'll all be looking at various chapters of Revelation. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word and the information that, that you've given us and the future that you've showed us. And we thank you for your promises and your prophecies and most of all for Jesus' love for each one of us. We ask, we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as you know, we've been looking at the past few weeks the Bible says that one day soon, we are going to go through a seven year period called the tribulation or the time of distress, which coincides with the return of Jesus. And so we're gonna look at the timeline of the seven years of tribulation and, and I hope that you'll follow along with, with an app or the Bible or the Pew Bibles or your Bible. And now according to, to many experts in, in Bible prophecy, the likely last major prophecy to be fulfilled before the beginning of the tribulation is a war that is found in the book of Ezekiel. And it's described in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. And it's between Israel, the nation of Israel, and the nations of Russia and Iran and Turkey, along with a few others of their allies. So, but we're not gonna look at that today because that's a whole another separate message. Revelation describes the tribulation that comes after that great war or perhaps in the middle of the tribulation. But Revelation has a purpose and it's not, it tells us about the, the, the tribulation coming but its major purpose, the major purpose of the book of Revelation is to reveal Jesus to us. See, if you look at verse one, it tells us exactly why it was written. It tells us the title of the book. Revelation chapter one, verse one. The revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So John is the author of the book of Revelation. But it very clearly tells us, God, this revelation, this book, is what God has given to show his servants what must soon take place. And the full title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And verse 1 tells us the purpose. It, it shows us where we are going. Revelation chapter 2, verse, verse Revelation chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3 are the letters to the seven churches of Revelation. Revelation chapter four and five show us the throne room of God where the people and angels of heaven are worshiping Jesus. Now remember, after I finish this, we're going into the book of Revelation. So I, I'm trying to avoid overlapping today's message with what we're going to see in the future when we get into 
deeper into the book of Revelation. And so, 4 and 5 show us the throne room of God. And in Revelation chapter 5, God the Father holds up a scroll with seven seals on it. Now, seven, you're going to hear seven a lot in the book of Revelation, but seven is the number of perfection. And so this is an important scroll. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw the right hand of the one seated on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. I also saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even look at it. I wept, John, I wept and wept because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even look at it. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And, and so you got this picture of things happening in heaven, and an angel asks the question, who is worthy to open this scroll? Well, no one is. No one human is worthy enough for this important responsibility. But one of the elders, and the elders are, are worshiping around the throne, one of the elders points to Jesus, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, points to Jesus and says, the lion of Judah, he is worthy. And so Jesus opens the scroll. And with the scrolls open, the story of the tribulation begins in chapter 6, where the Lamb of God opens the scroll, breaks each of the seven seals one at a time, and each seal, break, each seal being broken brings some sort of devastation to the earth. And so we know during the tribulation, God releases judgment through a series of these seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. Now, the, the chronology, the timeline of Revelation is hard to chart or hard to follow because the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, they all overlap. And, and sometimes they describe the same plagues or the same devastation happening. And so God's judgment happens in a series of sevens because God's judgment is perfect. And seven is considered the perfect number. And so Revelation tells us there are, there are seven characters who play a part in the drama of everything that's going to happen from, from that point forward. Mainly Revelation chapter 12 through 14. Well, the first of the characters is the dragon, or Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Now, the dragon is Satan, and the dragon makes war for three and a half years 
until he's defeated by an angelic army and thrown to earth. I, I didn't look into it too much because that would have taken us in a different path, but it, it's possible that this has already happened and that's what's described in the book of Isaiah where Satan is thrown down to earth. But like I said, the timelines are sometimes a little difficult to follow because there's a lot of stuff happening and, and some of it's overlapping. Now, the second character is the woman. And the woman represents the church. Revelation chapter 12, verses 13 through 17. And we're going to look at verses 14 and 15 this morning. The woman is given two wings of a great eagle so that she could fly from the serpent's presence to the place in the wilderness where she was nourished for a time times and half a time okay so now we have we have a timeline here a time is a year times is two years and half a time is half a year three and a half years right so at the three and a half year mark the woman begins to, they begins to experience persecution and is carried on eagle's wings of divine protection for the rest of the tribulation. Now, remember, the, I said the, the woman represents the church. So, somehow the church is going to be involved somehow and, and God's going to protect it. The third character that shows up is the beast from the sea, who is the, not, not, not Godzilla, I know Godzilla is still popular, and maybe that's where they get it from, but the beast from the sea is the Antichrist, Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 10. Verse 1. And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads. On its horns were ten crowns, and on its heads were blasphemous names. So, so this beast has, has ten crowns, he, which represents he's the ruler of many nations. And then John, if, if that wasn't bad enough, John describes the beast in verse 2. The beast I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. The dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. Well, if you look all the way back to the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 7, the leopard represented the Greek Empire, the bear represented the Persians, which is modern-day Iran, and the lion represented Babylon, which is considered modern-day Iraq. What, so what does that mean? Well, the simple answer is it's most likely the beast will be from the Middle East. And we'll learn a little bit more next week. And the, Revel the rest of Revelation chapter 13 verse 2 says this. The dragon gave the beast his power his throne, and great authority. Now, 
in Jewish literature, Jewish apocalyptic literature and Midrash, which is commentary on, on the scripture, things that come from the sea are considered from the Gentile world. The beast who is the Antichrist will be a demon-possessed Gentile and he will be a fake imitation of Jesus. He will almost die and he will almost rise from the dead. And then the Bible tells us the beast was given a mouth to utter boasts and blasphemies. Remember, God is in control here. Things will only happen what God allows to happen. So the beast is given a mouth to utter boast and blasphemies. It was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. You done the math? 42 months is three and a half years. So a lot of things begin to happen. A lot of, a lot of things begin to explode or, or, or heat up it at the three and a half year mark. Now, the beast is from the earth, the false prophet, and things that come from the earth, remember, things that come from the sea are Gentile. Things that come from the earth are considered Jewish. And so during the final three and a half years, the beast, who's also called the false prophet, will be Jewish, who will come and deceive many, convincing them to follow the malt the, the, the false messiah, the antichrist. And the false prophet will control much of the world's economic system through his quote unquote mark. And you know, they, they used to, in some of the apocalyptic books of the, the 70s and 80s, they talked about the mark of the beast and they had trouble conceiving some of it but you know here we are in in 2024 and you know my, my phone my phone is also connected with my with the bank or there's you know there's qr codes there's all these things and the bible tells us in revelation chapter 13 verses 16 and 17 and it makes everyone great and small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, that is the false prophet, the antichrist, it makes everyone small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. The beast's name or the number of its name is, and of course that's where we get 666 from. And, and so the, the dragon and the two beasts form this, this unholy, this evil trinity, but God holds true to the promise about a core group of worshipers. In Revelation chapter seven and chapter 14, they are known as the 144,000. Revelation chapter 14 verses one through five tells us about them. And John says this, then I looked, and there was the Lamb, 
Jesus standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And that was probably considered unusual. But, you know, these days people, some people have their whole face tattooed. But it tells us that the 144 had Jesus and the Father's name written on their forehead as opposed to the mark of the beast on the right hand and the forehead. And they were singing, they were worshiping, which is one thing that we will be doing when we get to heaven. And then verse 3 says, They sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders, but no one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. So that's interesting. And by the way, the Jehovah's Witnesses falsely take this verse and twist it. They, they, they say the elders and the Jehovah's Witnesses are the, the chosen ones, the 144,000. Well, that's just twisting the Bible and taking it out of context because here it gives us some information, but we don't know enough about it. But if you ever hear the 144,000 connected with Jehovah's Witnesses, it, it's false, it's misapplied scripture. Just ignore it. Now, the sixth group of characters is the proclamation of three angels. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 11. And so these three angels, they're flying overhead to announce the eternal gospel. One of them says, He spoke with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of, this, of his judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And then the second angel says, and another, a second angel followed saying, it has fallen, Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nation drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath, in verse eight. And then the third angel says, And another, a third angel followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. So, these three angels bring good news, bad news, and really bad, ugly news. What's going to happen to people that take the mark of the beast? And then there are the people of the harvest. Revelation chapter 14, verse 15. Then I looked, and there was a white cloud, and one like the Son of Man was seated on the cloud with, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Another angel came out of the temple, crying out in a loud voice to the one who was seated on the cloud, Use your sickle and reap, for the time to reap has come, 
since the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the one seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested, harvested. So the people of the earth are going to be harvested by God. Now, why is this important? Do we see this anywhere else in the Bible? Well, of course we do. We see this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, where Jesus spoke about a great harvest to come at the end of the age. Jesus said, Matthew chapter 13, verses 37 through 43. He replied, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the word, is the world, and the good seed, these are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather from his kingdom all who cause sin and those guilty of lawlessness. And it tells us what will happen. They will be thrown into the blazing furnace where, they, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Let anyone who has ears listen. See, the, the, the single reason that Jesus left heaven the single reason that Jesus laid aside his glory as the only begotten Son of God and the sole reason that Jesus took on flesh or became human and lived a lowly and limited human life and the single reason he went to the cross was to, 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 to diminish or make smaller this harvest at the end of the age. And as terrible as, the, the, as Satan the dragon is, and the Antichrist and the beast from the earth, this harvest is going to be God's greatest regret. Because if he could have saved them, he would have. But they made a choice, just as we all have a choice to make. And so even today, he is, he is holding his hand and holding out hope that each and every one of us would turn towards him and accept his love and forgiveness so that we can spend eternity with him, rather away from him in the place that will be Perpetual weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation starts with messages to the seven churches. It, it moves to the seven sealed judgments. The seven trumpet judgments. And the seven characters who all play a part and the seven bowls of judgment. So as you go through Revelation, there's a lot of stuff happening. There's, there's stuff in heaven. There's, there's stuff under the earth. There's stuff happening on the earth. The great battle of Armageddon takes place in chapter 16. The seven messages of judgment take place in chapter 17 and 18. And the return of Jesus takes place in chapter 19. So hopefully that clears it up. Big picture, anyways. And the battle of Armageddon is both the sixth 
trumpet and the sixth bowl judgment. There, it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 16. Armageddon is the final battle before the end of time. And here's the description for chapter 16. The sixth poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and the water, its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. So they assembled the kings at a place in, called in Hebrew Armageddon. And once the troops are all gathered in this central valley of Israel, the seven judgments begin and the king returns. Now, the, the seal and the trumpets and the bowl judgments aren't sequential. In other words, one, two, three, four, they're, they're some are happening at the same time, some are happening here, others are happening here. They overlap, but they all come together at the end. And the bowls, the bowls of judgment catch up with the trumpets in the sixth judgment. And both of them catch up with the seals in the seventh judgment. And this is what happens. The seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, and the seventh bowl all end with thunder and lightning, an earthquake, a trumpet, and the return of Jesus. You find that in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, ch Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and Revelation chapter 16, verse 17. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand in the presence of God. Seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel with a golden incense burner came and stood at the altar. He was given a large amount of incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar in front of the throne. The angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Revelation chapter 8. Then the seven trumpets come. And the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. That is the final seal judgment. And so let's look at the seventh trumpet judgment. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were, there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Verse 19. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumbles, and peals of thunder, an earthquake, and severe hail. And then the final bowl, the seventh bowl, judgment. Verse 17. Then the seventh poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, it is done. In verse 17, God accomplishes his plan. He says, it is done. It's also repeated in Revelation chapter 21, verse 6. God establishes his kingdom, 
and he completes his wrath. But here's the thing. Instead, the people, instead of turning to God, they rebelled and blasphemed God. Enormous hailstones, each weighing 100 pounds, fell from the sky on the people. And they blasphemed God for the plague of hail because the plague was extremely severe. So how does, how does the tribulation end? Well, John tells us in Revelation chapter 9. Uh, chapter 19, but... Nine, chapter 19, verses 11 through 12, and verse 16. Then I saw heaven opened, and there was a white horse. Its rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a fiery flame, and many crowns were on his head. He had a name written that no one knows except himself. Verse 16, and he has a name written on his robe and on his thigh, King of kings and Lord of lords. No doubt, the Lord Jesus Christ is the rider on the horse. And so at the end of the battle, verses 19 and 21, then I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and against his army. But the beast was taken prisoner and along with the false prophet who had performed the signs in its presence, he deceived those who accepted the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its, its image with these signs. Both of them were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword that comes from the mouth of the rider. The sword that comes from the mouth of the rider is the word of God. On the horse and all the birds ate the fill of their flesh. So at the end of tribulation, Jesus returns. Okay, so the question is, how do we as believers get through the end times? Well, there are three things that I think you need to do in order to get through them. Number one, walk closely with Jesus. Two, encourage others about walking with Jesus. And three, pray and share the good news. See, the Bible from beginning to end tells us about Jesus. It tells us about things that are going to happen. And if we believe we have a Savior that we can rely on. And so the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Will you be found faithful when he comes? And if you can't say for sure, and if you ha are not sure if you've invited Jesus into your life, then I want you to know that you're only one prayer away from his love and forgiveness and being a forever member of his family. Just comes down to a simple prayer asking for Jesus' forgiveness and inviting him into your life. Amen. Let us pray. We know that Jesus, that God is with us. And so let us trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. In all of our ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight today, this week, and in the future. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.